I'm. And, and I strongly encourage people who are on the, if you can put your headphones, I strongly encourage people who are sitting on the sides to come and join. There are many seats at the table. It's much better as a format. Fouad? <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> my name is Bertrand de La Chapelle. It's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, for this meeting. The theme is What Frameworks for Cross-Border Online Communities and Services? Do you all get your uh, heat headphones working correctly? Yes? Okay. And so the starting point I would like to make is what is the context of this workshop? As you see, it's organized under the label of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project which is an initiative that was launched in January 2012. Maybe if we could close the door temporarily, people will, will come. come. Come to the table. Come to the table. People in the audience are almost as knowledgeable as the people in the panel, actually. <laughs> so it was launched in uh, January 2012. And the purpose, as you can see in the brochure that was distributed in your bag, is to address the tension between the cross-border internet and cross-border platforms and an international system that is based on national jurisdictions. This process is an ongoing multi-stakeholder discussion and this meeting this year at the IGF in Baku is, let's say, the annual milestone that we want to use every year to present the evolution of the discussion that has taken place sometimes in private meetings or in public meetings during the year. We will do the same in Bali next year to take stock of the progress of the discussion. <clears throat> during the course of this year, we have identified, first of all, we have set up an observatory that makes a curation of cases regarding jurisdiction. You have the information on the site and in the brochures that have been distributed. I don't get into details. But the different meetings that we've had have highlighted two big tracks. One is the transboundary impact of national laws and national decisions on other jurisdictions and other sovereignties, particularly in what regards the domain name system and the logical layer of the Internet. The second track is related more to the platforms, and particularly the social media platforms, in the fact that they have terms of service that serve in a certain way as the law of the digital territory that they represent. As long as you are on the servers of Facebook or YouTube, you are basically under the terms of service of Facebook or YouTube, and it directs a lot of what you can or cannot do on the platform. We had in that regard... <clears throat> Excuse me. We had in that regard, in September, a workshop that we organized on the very theme of this workshop today. It was in Stanford, and we had around the table major platforms, mostly U.S. for the moment, but it will expand afterwards. We had Google, Yahoo, um, Facebook, um, uh, Microsoft, Disney, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter but also Privacy International, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Center for Democracy and Technology. The goal of the, meeting, the session today, in a nutshell, is to make a, a sort of evaluation and a taking stock of the main themes that have emerged during those discussions, to discuss them among ourselves, to go deeper and see whether they are perceived as appropriate framing of the problem, and in a second phase, to see how to move forward, what kind of instruments can be developed, what kind of process can be envisaged to try to find solution to this tension. And so we have invited a certain number of, of, of people that you have seen on the, um, 
uh, on the widely distributed <laughs> promotional paper. Um, unfortunately, Fiona Alexander, who uh, had kindly accepted to participate in the workshop, had to leave earlier than she planned, and she left yesterday. And we have, in the person of Michael Niebel, uh, an excellent replacement that has the, the same outlook. <laughs> Um, and likewise, we regret that Marilia Maciel was not able to, um, uh, to join. And we have um, uh, somebody from um, the Center for Internet and Society in India, uh, Shimayi Arun, who is joining us uh, as well. And finally, Konstantinos Komaitis is reducing again the gender balance that was carefully planned in this workshop, replacing Constance Baumler. He's from ISOC as well. Constance had a, had a conflict of interest. So let me, let me start by launching a first, a first question that maybe is more oriented towards the various operators. It can be Brian uh, or, or Patrick. How they feel the tension how does it translate in their everyday life particularly i mean the tension sorry between their activity and the multiplicity of national frameworks that they have to respect and also the diversity of requests that they can get from legitimate or not national operators requesting takedowns access to privacy data and so on who wants to to have a have a go? <laughs> Brian, Brian is introduce yourself in the first um, segment. Sure, thank you very much. My name is Brian Cute. I'm the CEO of Public Interest Registry. We are the operator of .org, and uh, I've been very happy to participate in the effort here and in, in addressing this important issue uh, over the last year. From a service provider perspective, there are a, a number of key principles that we need to adhere to. First of all, Public Interest Registry as the operator of .org and a not-for-profit supporting organization to the Internet Society is that we are expected to and we expect of ourselves to act as an exemplary registry at all times. Um, certainly, acting as an ex exemplary registry includes being a good law-abiding citizen. Uh, as one of our values. And uh, with respect to .org addresses that uh, come under the scrutiny of law enforcement and sometimes are subject to takedown requests from law enforcement agencies from around the world, we have to behave as a law-abiding citizen in an exemplary registry. We happen to be uh, located in Reston, Virginia in the United States. And when we receive requests of this nature, we uh, take those on board we have a legal team, uh, and we review the whether it's a subpoena or a court order or a request with a criminal basis. Uh, we look at that through a legal, legal lens and make decisions about whether we comply with a particular request or order in that, in that light. Uh, we do receive requests from jurisdictions outside the U.S. Uh, we ask that court orders and other requests of that nature come through the Virginia courts where there is a mechanism for recognizing those. Um, but we do recognize this issue of takedown requests of domain names as being a growing issue. The number of takedown requests from law enforcement entities around the world is growing. Interpol just executed uh, a very large takedown uh, with respect to pharmacites, numbering into the thousands. So that's the background and of course we try to behave as an exemplary registry and a law-abiding citizen. Where it gets interesting for us is, at a first level, is the example I'll use is a case called Roja Directa. There was a Spanish website, RojaDirecta.org. They also had other iterations, .es.com. But it was a site that had uh, sports-oriented content that would direct you to other websites where you could view sporting events. Allegations were made that that content was infringing. A Spanish court held twice that it was not, that it was legal. Then there was a court case in New York where the domain and the site came under the view of a U.S. court which <coughs> held, uh, at least in a temporary fashion, that it was in fact infringing and that we needed to take it down. 
.org and any domain, any top level domain is globally accessible, globally available, globally resolvable. That's the nature of the domain name system. Yet here we have one jurisdiction which is saying this is legal and lawful, and we have another saying no it's not. It happens to be the one we live in. We comply. The proceeding in that case was an ex parte proceeding. Now, this is perfectly acceptable under U.S. jurisprudence to have a proceeding where the party against whom the charges are brought does not appear. But this raises questions of due process. How can Roja Director have an opportunity to defend itself in an ex parte hearing? So these are some of the issues, these are some of the tensions that we, uh, we, we have to be a global operator, we have to make ORG globally accessible, therefore it's available in multiple jurisdictions, but we have these tensions and these conflicts, and so these are some of the fundamental principles that we've been able to begin to identify and bring to the surface so that we can have a deeper conversation about these issues. Thank you. Uh, this case is an illustration of the tension and the potential extraterritorial extension of a national sovereignty. We can come back to that later. Uh, and the second dimension is the fact that as a global operator, you are subject to requests from yes, other sir. jurisdictions that have currently to go through a U.S. court procedure. The third point that you highlighted uh, indirectly is something that um, Carlos Afonso from uh, Getulio Vargas this morning mentioned regarding the uh, law in preparation in Brazil, which is the question of should the DNS layer be used as a content control panel or should it be uh, kept as neutral as possible. Just wanted to highlight those three elements to paint the beginning of the picture. What we're trying to do today is a bit of an impressionist painting, like we will put a certain number of dots so that the picture is as complete as possible. Uh, I don't have the ambition to solve, uh, even with those eminent people, the question of jurisdiction in an hour, one hour and a half. <laughs> Watch out. Patrick, can you give the perspective from um, a company that has search engine, but also many other services, particularly YouTube, uh, and how it you uh, feel the uh, request about content that is um, allowed or not allowed on, on your platform from foreign jurisdictions in particular? Well, thank you, and that's a really easy question because as a company like Google, we really don't have any experience like that. No. You know, it's there's there's nothing that we do that's controversial at all. Why did I? Uh, <laughs> um, so yes, this is obviously something that's uh, very true to our hearts. You know, Google itself, in in uh, in many respects, is a platform that uh, hosts content for users, and uh, what works in some jurisdictions doesn't necessarily. Uh, you know, is, is, isn't necessarily acceptable in other jurisdictions. And, and so, you know, our, our approach is to try to grab a core set of values and establish those in community guidelines and to uh, make sure that to the extent that we can, that it's applicable globally on a global basis so that uh, so the freedom of expression of users is guaranteed. Uh, we've, of course, seen just very recently that that's, uh, you know, that's a very difficult thing to maintain in many cases. I mean, the you know the innocence of Muslim videos is is one of those, you know, one of those very recent examples that a lot of people are talking about here at the IGF, um, and um, you know it's just a fact of life that in order to maintain freedom of expression and maintain those values, we need to uh, be comfortable with the fact that um, you know we're just not going to like everything that's that's posted online and we're not going to agree with it. And so you know coming up with a framework that that that, that uh, is acceptable. Uh, on a global basis is something that's very difficult. I think the Roja Directa case is a terrific example of, of, of another one of those tensions that, uh, um, you know, that wasn't a Google case, but it's something that's very similar to the type of thing that we, that we, uh, that we feel is very important to protect. And it stands for many of the reasons why, you know, Google came out so strong in the SOPA PIPA debate earlier this year. Uh, the uh, for those of you that that, uh, that I'm sure most everybody here knows, but uh, but just to refresh the uh, you know there was a proposed law in the United States that would have allowed for takedowns of websites based on content without due process. In other words, it's a, it's an ex parte proceeding. If you claim that there's a violation, uh, the, the 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 claimant would be able to go to court and ask that that website get taken down without the other party being present and, and able to defend. And, and, and make their case. 
and uh, we find that to be a very a very troubling thing and so this this idea of of, uh, of jurisdiction and of due process, even though, you know, as an American company, we like to talk about due process sort of as, a, as something that we're so proud of, that we invented and we're so good at. Let's face it, right, in the United States, we're not always that great at it, right? And so this whole SOPA PIP, I think, is an example of that. And so it's a problem that's, that's faced globally, and it's also one that we face at home as well. Thank you. At that stage, is there anybody in the audience who is in, in the uh, um, either involved in the management of a top-level domain or an address registrar or an ISP or another platform that would have an additional comment from personal experience. Yes? Go ahead. Hello, this is Athena Fraguli from the RIPE NCC. Yeah. RIPE NCC is the regional internet registry for, um, for resources such as IP addresses and AS numbers. Uh, for Europe, Middle East, and Central Asia. And as a matter of fact, yes, I have an, a very concrete example. Uh, last year, there was a case uh, that the FBI was investigating, and maybe some of you know this case is the DNS changer case. Mm. Um, so part of the investigation, or part of Try, the FBI trying to solve the problem uh, with the minimum possible impact to, to users, uh, they asked regional internet registries to freeze the records in their database about the, you know, the, the IP addresses in question. So what they did, they went to, to the court, to the American court, they got a court order, they went to the ARIN, which is the regional internet registry for uh, the North America. The ARIN complied. Fine. Then they came to us. And we said, well, we are in the Netherlands. And we can comply to a Dutch court order. They said, fine. However, they came back with a police order. And... Uh, so we, we obeyed because we were, they, con they confirmed, we were reassured that we have to obey. That we, we have no option. We would be liable if we wouldn't obey. So we obeyed. We freeze the resources. And then uh, we made some, you know, s some reviewing of this order. And we realized that, uh, it, well, the legal basis wasn't that good defined. The procedure wasn't that good defined. And, well, now we have uh, actually a court case <laughs> with, uh, with uh, uh, the authorities, with the Dutch authorities about that. Because, yes, it was, it was a case that it was clear something dodgy was, was going on, yes. The problem is uh, lying with the trust and the transparency. So if we cannot trust, we have a, you know, a diligent process, as, as you said, how we can comply with orders and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, apologies for trying to m ask for short comments. I see Peter Van Roost was from Center. I don't ask you to uh, make a, a statement, but keep in mind that what we're saying about global top-level domains is multiplied by as many uh, country code top-level domains that sometimes are closed to the country and sometimes are very expensive. Somebody was giving me the example of .co, which is actually having multiple implantations and a completely open policy that makes it look like a, a GTLD in a certain way. I want to, to move one step further, although we could spend the whole workshop on this, on this topic. Go one step further and maybe ask Konstantinos to highlight and explain as briefly as possible what the notion of in-rem uh, means to determine uh, jurisdiction. After we had the uh, ex parte, let's continue with the Latin script. <laughs> Thanks, Bertrand, uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, very, very briefly, a and step introduce back. Uh, oh, again. yes, yes. Uh, uh, very briefly, uh, just a step back. Back in the day when the internet was still, I, I, I surely was not using the internet to very highly 
uh, interesting academic papers appeared, so I'm putting my academic hat on right now. So Professor Johnson and Post actually said that we don't really need, the, the cyberspace new needs brand new laws. And in a great response by Professor Goldsmith, he said actually we don't because international law is there and can provide solutions. So jurisdiction has always been a very tricky case in the, in the context of the internet. Now, uh, in the context of in REM, and to go back to Bertrand's question, and the problem that actually registries such as PIR are facing is the following. Uh, the United States, starting in 1998, with the introduction of the Anti-Cyber Squad and Consumer Protection Act that wanted to deal uh, with the disputes between trademarks and domain names, uh, at some point faced the challenge of what will happen if we cannot find who the registrant is. So, and that was a crucial question because there were a lot of cases that the registrant uh, was not providing information, so there could not serve um, a process could not be served. So Congress decided at the time uh, that domain names are property rights, and to that effect, the provision of in rem jurisdiction is applicable, which means that the trademark owner through the ACPA can turn against the domain name itself. Now, registries had to comply with that because the domain name being property is located in the United States and in particular in Virginia. So that raised the whole many, many issues uh, and the interim provision then appeared consistently in the proposals of the first COICA, then SOPA and then PIPA because this is the only way actually that you can take down a domain name legally and the court can order the domain name through that process by turning against the domain name itself. So through this provision what courts are doing and what Congress sought to do was to catch those cases where the registrant is not appearing or uh, is uh, escaping uh, and you cannot find him through the WHOIS database and all those issues. And as you can understand, this raises a much bigger issue of what will happen, and this is the question, if other jurisdictions go and start creating interim provisions and start having, and we start seeing multiple cases uh, on the same exactly domain name, the question that nobody seems to be able to answer at this stage is which decision will actually prevail? Will it be the US court or will it be, for example, a European or a Chinese or whatever else court? Thanks. For the transcript, this was Konstantinos Komaitis from uh, ISOC. And uh, my question as a quick follow-up is, the way I understand what you're describing is the potential for what could be almost called a jurisdictional arms race, where every single country is trying to reaffirm its sovereignty and its competence, and the likelihood of conflicts of jurisdiction uh, increases in proportion. Most of the cases that I've already made mention have a component of this, because in some cases, Hora Directa is one example, deemed legal one place, deemed illegal in another one. I give you just as a contribution from what we've identified during the program. On matters of defamation, in the same month, the Supreme Court of Canada has determined that the fact that a content, a defamatory content, was visible in Canada was sufficient to justify the competence of the courts. A month later, or more or less, the Supreme Court of Ireland uh, as determined exactly the reverse and declared that it was not competent because the content was on a website uh, hosted in England for an English newspaper. And we are seeing more and more situations of either attempts at solving the same case through different courts or refusal of jurisdiction, which is a huge legal uncertainty for users, for platforms, and for, and for others. Let me, let me move forward uh, uh, in, in that regard because what you suggested is that basically there is one extreme which is this jurisdictional arms race between national jurisdiction and on the other hand the exit route of international regime, international treaties that are difficult to, to achieve. 
intermediary routes, I would like to to ask um, maybe uh, Michael Nebo, <coughs> as a um, person from the uh, European Commission. The European Union is a space that has struggled and coped with and addressed this issue of do you harmonize, do you uh, make it uniform, do you make interoperable the jurisdictions of 27 countries in many other aspects. Can you share some experience and how you see that translated to this problem, but also how do you see the European Union, Union as a whole dealing with international platforms that are, that are located uh, elsewhere? And please say, say your name at the beginning of the conference. Michael Newell, European Commission. Um, thank you, Bertrand. You introduced me. I'm, I, I share the same views with the, the lady I replace. I cannot promise that. Um, same the, look. The, uh, the look. Outlook or look? Okay. <laughs> the, the, um, first of all, I mean, this is not a completely new problem. I remember I've been working uh, at some time way back when, when there was a, a pipeline gas supply deal done between Europe and uh, the uh, Soviet Union at the time, and we had a, a massive conflict of law. One country, which I don't want to name here, had uh, a massive application, uh, extraterritorial application of its national law in Europe. So just to, to say this is not... Now, y you asked how... We, what have we done? Because it's, it's a, nice, a nice box. We have these 27 countries, and we have started to to tackle the differences. Well, that was just not for fun. That was to create a single market. And that's what we want to have for the Internet as well. So you want to have free flow of something. And that was the free flow of goods, people, and, and services uh, in, in our case. And we, we, we kind of uh, uh, experimented with different tools. It, it was, was not always the same, same thing. You had, you had, on the one side... You could work via mutual recognition, uh, and you could, as another extreme, uh, have harmonization. And then you could go in between to have a minimum harmonization, and then you could not refuse the free flow with the argument, oh, this is uh, different in my country, because you had this minimum harmonization. So lots of our legislation is based on principles which, which allow for the free flow of goods and services, and we have, and that is not only, and we have it in, as a very simple example: the free flow of television signals. Uh, so, having just just creating a space where where television could go uh, across the borders, and there you have all the questions of protection of consumers, the protection of children, uh, advertising times, and all, all kinds of a plethora of issues. So, so this is this is a toolbox where we have. Um, some experience in. Now, globally, what have we done? I was doing in the, at, the, at the beginning of the United States Data Protection Directive, and what did we do there? We said, okay, we want to have, of course, we don't want to close off uh, the European shop for data flows. And when we started with that, we didn't, of course, know anything about the world.
in, in the case of, let's take Safe Harbor, it's negotiation, seeing what, do we have the same levels and, and who, who, that's a different approach. Thank you. Yes, Brian. Thanks. No, I'd like to, Brian Cute, I'd like to follow up on that too. And I, I agree. I don't think it's necessarily extraterritorial application of law if you have a country um, uh, willingly engaging in a safe harbor type exercise or one country saying, um, this is our regime and, and sh we can put it up against an equivalency test and it's deemed to be equivalent. Um, I have actually in the past been in, in a job that involved extraterritorial application of U.S. law for export transactions that happened completely offshore. And, but this is, this is some of the worry. So uh, the point, first point is there are mechanisms that can be worked out between governments to have mutual recognition. Um, that, that's not new, and that's helpful. But going forward, uh, .org PIR, we are based in the U.S., and we're a wholesaler for .org, and our retailers around the world sell them. But as this world begins to change and we might become more active outside of the U.S., this is where the concern comes in. If we begin to market directly into countries, that can be an indicia of a jurisdictional hook. If you have a partner in the country, that becomes the indicia of a jurisdictional hook. So it's, it's not just extraterritorial application of laws, but what actions do you take that might put yourself under the jurisdiction of another country that has a, a regime or a set of rules that you may find um, um, questionable from a due process perspective in one example. These are the concerns. Let me jump uh, on this uh, and make a segue on the question of, of uh, due process with Shim Mai. Uh, but before we move there, are there any comments from, from the room on what we just discussed? Brief contributions that you would like to, to chime in? Any remark? Please. If we can have uh, the mic for this person. And please say your name and, um, and comment. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Faisal Hassan. Uh, I'm from ISOC, Bangladesh. Uh, I want to draw your attention that uh, you probably know that uh, for the last two months, uh, YouTube has been blocked in Bangladesh. And uh, we think the government has uh, negotiated with the company who, where the content is hosted but we don't see enough response from the company and it's it's a matter of uh, discrimination because the same company has blocked the same video uh, in different countries but when we talk about our country we hear excuses like we don't have server we don't have offices and i think gl global companies have responsibilities to address these issues uh, promptly because the government has a role to play as well to protect the citizens thank you thank you uh, Fuad, is that on that uh, topic? Oh, go ahead. Um, I think for any government... Say, say your name for the transcript. Uh, Fuad Bajwa, I'm from Pakistan. I think for any government to um, work, work on such issues, there should be some kind of a agreement in terms of international... Uh, understanding on these, maybe it will be principle-oriented, I would never see some sort of a legislation actually evolving because in international context, there may be things agreed between countries, but the implementation will always be a challenge, e even in offline treaties. The second most uh, issue, the most recent issue that we saw because of the video on YouTube, that's a fourth an example where the governments didn't know what to do. And when public morality was hurt and public order uh, was challenged, uh, uh, compromised. Only then the government sh governments took an immediate action to block it. Now they are sitting and thinking about the, was this action correct or not. But but at the same time, the the extent to which these things can go, these are examples. Like my colleague from Bangladesh, what we did is copied by their government. It has some kind of a cause and effect relation to it. So this is also very important to see that even if there's some sort of an agreement, ah, there's another thing. Uh, there's rumor to this that, for example, there's a multilateral uh, uh, legal assistance treaties signed between two contracting parties. It is even believed to this extent that not blocking the video at the top level to two countries like Libya and Egypt, but not blocking it to two other countries, and they had to implement their own blocks, was sort of uh, 
uh, uh, an attempt to make those countries sign the M alert. So this is another challenge. The, the threat to, uh, when we try to identify jurisdictional issues, this, this kind of uh, uh, theories also evolve. Thank you. Um, I will keep, if you don't mind, the uh, MLATS question for the last part regarding the kind of tools that, 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 can, be, uh, that can be used. The point that uh, we're exploring here are things that are related to the due process uh, provisions and we're talking a lot about governments and the rules of governments but there are also due process issues inside the platforms in the way they implement their own terms of service and uh, handle the requests sometimes from users like the flags uh, and the compatibility with the terms of service but also how they handle requests that can come from countries to um, have a content not accessible in one country, but accessible in another. One question to, to Patrick, and then uh, I will ask in Mani. Um, is geo IP location uh, an appropriate tool to do this kind of selective filtering or non-accessibility? How does the thing that Google has done for Blogspot, for instance, of using the CCTLD as a default a response also to make a distinction between access to the same type of content in different countries. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? And then I can sure. Well, thank you all again, first of all, for, for, for asking such uh, easy questions of me. I always, uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, hit back a softball. Um, the, uh, well, look, the, 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 let, me just, let me just make sort of one obvious statement that I think um, that, that I think is, for me, is at least quite, um, um, you know, when I, when I first started hearing some of these statistics, it really shined a lot of light for me on the, on the level of complication here. The YouTube platform itself is uh, a massive platform. In, in just one minute's time now, uh, users will upload 72 hours of video. That's a lot of video. It's impossible for any, for, for any, person to review that material in advance and in order to you know determine what's what's appropriate and what isn't and because of that uh, we've established community guidelines we, re we rely on the community itself to to um, you know to report violations of those guidelines now um, you know this is uh, this gets complicated and somewhat controversial but in order to be able to have a platform that people trust and that people are going to continue to use and that's going to be you know this great rich source of content uh, we need to be uh, you know true to those guidelines and we need to be consistent with them and one of those guidelines isn't whether or not something is um, you know is, is is even good you know there's a lot of surfing squirrels on videos uh, videos on, on, on YouTube that uh, that uh, surprisingly just get an amazing amount of views and then there's other videos that are you know that are very offensive that don't get views some that do get views um, but um, the, the the point is that uh, you know we firmly believe that this that this platform is something that that should continue to flourish on a global basis and that the value that it creates for the global community for free expression for users to you know use a platform in order to create videos and share with their families and loved ones is a really important thing to maintain um, how do you now how do you, you know, block these, these these types of things when they when they come uh, you know when they become controversial um, well um, uh, sorry, I would make a distinction okay. to mm -hmm. help the answer the, 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 the question. Um, let's not talk about things that are controversial at that stage, things that are illegal in one country but not illegal somewhere else. How to discriminate without resorting to a choice where both sides are wrong? It cannot be suppressed worldwide just because in one country it's illegal. And on the end, it cannot be not blocked at all if it's illegal in one country just because uh, it should be available everywhere. So this is why the question of GOIP uh, filtering for videos, for instance, is a tool that is suggested often, but does this lead to fragmentation or not? And in the case of Blogspot and Twitter, actually, I've also adopted the same thing. The idea is if you use Twitter in one country, the default access will be through the CCTLD of your country with the applicability of the local law plus 
the capacity to change your default to do an equivalent of cyber travel and choose another jurisdiction. How are these things being discussed, if, if at all, and are there appropriate ways to move forward? Well, the uh, look the, the localization of content is 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 something that is uh, uh, you know uh, you know according to the domain name and all of these things is something that's an increasing trend and we're seeing a lot of that you know coming you know, going to be more likely probably with all of the various different uh, generic top level domains or the you know that are being applied through 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 ICANN the the concept of a domain is is increasing greatly. You know, just as we speak, and hopefully at some point, uh, I can will resolve those processes, and we'll be able to have a, you know, we'll be able to have a system that, that really flourishes uh, and encourages further further innovation, um, you know, along those lines. And I think we're going to have to see how that develops over the course of the next, over the next couple of years. Um, but um, I would say that the, um, you know, that. You know, we need to keep in mind that the Internet itself is a, uh, you know, a, you've used the term, Bertrand, the cyberspace, and that there's cyberspaces, and that, you know, let's face it, the, there are multiple, and you know, even though there's not, uh, maybe, we'd be sort of offended by the idea of multiple Internets, there really are different, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, in, in different countries, different jurisdictions that, that certainly apply. Um, the, you know, we would, we, we should also respect the user's right to travel to some extent, right? And there is a, um, you know, there's an, an ability for, for many people in many different countries to get on a plane and go somewhere and, and to, you know, when they land, you know, in, in, that, in that location to be able to have access to, you know, the, um, the, the, the content, access to the, the laws, rights, and privileges in the country where they land. And the Internet enables a lot of that uh, kind of travel um, without getting on a plane, right? And so I think that's a good thing. And uh, we should, you know, we should continue to encourage uh, encourage users to be able to use the internet for travel, um, and to uh, you know to have access to the world through the internet in that way. Let, let me let me um, go to uh, Shinmai uh, Arun, who is with the Center for Internet and Society in in India, but also National Law University in Delhi. Um, delving a little bit deeper on the. Um, due process notion. Can you illustrate maybe a certain number of the principles that you've seen emerging as being recognized in all cases that relate, for instance, to uh, seizures, takedowns, uh, law enforcement requests to privacy access? Is there an emerging consensus on some principles? Um, and I'll come to Council of Europe after. So this need, needs to be thought about in two contexts. One is the notion of uh, values. Um, and these, as you can see from the discussion here, are contested globally. Although, uh, personally, I am of the opinion that when we have international human rights instruments that accept that certain values um, are, are universal, I, I don't personally think that it's acceptable to move away from them and then create sort of contextual um, other values, which uh, which can be used sometimes to justify violation of, say, privacy by excessive surveillance, by saying that, oh, we're a culture that needs more watching, or we're a culture that doesn't believe in privacy, right? But that apart, because um, that's a debate that will probably take much longer to resolve internationally. I'd, I'd get to, sorry, I'd, I'd like to address the question that uh, Brian raised about how to deal with um, multi-jurisdictional conflicts and values and how to decide in what contexts to give in to different legal orders and alongside to also address the Bangladeshi and Pakistani concerns about how to react when a global multinational corporation uh, seems to treat uh, different say countries differently in say the same context and what I thought might be useful here is this uh, 2009 paper by Derek Bambauer but the same values have been reflected in the Stanford workshop that Bertrand talked about and it's basically that a lot of it is about procedure so you can't get to values until due process forces countries to be open with what their values really are so the standards that I'm that I'm going to to illustrate here are um, openness, for instance. Right. So a country needs to be open about whether it censors at all, and if so, what exactly it censors. Uh, 
And in this context, it, it would be two things. One is admitting to the fact of censorship and admitting to certain, um, say, things like sedition, et cetera, that, uh, that are censored. And two is also admitting to occasions of censorship, right? So you don't see pages that uh, you, when something is censored, your block message should tell you clearly that it is censored. Two is transparency. So you need to know not only what broad categories of material are censored, but also what according to a government or according to a company falls within those categories of material. So um, anything that is uh, that may create a public order problem might be censored in, in various countries, but what specifically counts as material that creates a public order problem? Anything offensive might be censored, but what counts as offensive and what doesn't, all of that should be as clear as possible to everyone, and that's transparency. Narrowness means that you um, you try not to be over or under inclusive. So, for instance, um, you, you can't have an offensiveness standard that ends up extending to you know to everything, even to into little parodies or to if you remember what happened in the UK, somebody tweeted in jest about bombing an airport and got arrested. Right? So that's a little drastic. Under inclusiveness is when is is the situation that you described, which is that. Um, that why in, in one context is a video taken offline, whereas in another context it's okay for it to be online. It's, it's either um, offensive or it's not. Now if there is a transparent standard that tells you why the distinction is being made, then yes, you could argue that it isn't over or under inclusive, but basically the standard says that it's not okay to have a standard that covers everything and then leave some pornography online and take other pornography on, offline, because if it's, a, if, it's, if it's material that should be censored, then it should be censored all over. And the final one is accountability, which means that you need to you need to have an appeal process. And this is a huge problem in my country, along with transparency, which is that a we don't know what um, what kinds of information are being classified as offensive, what kinds of information are being taken down, and b when when you um, when you write to an intermediary, you basically give an intermediary notice, and you say that you find content on say YouTube offensive, take it down. The, the rule in the country is such that the intermediary would either have to risk quite a lot of litigation, which no company wants to risk, or the intermediary would have to take it down, even if it is a frivolous request. And uh, somebody from the Center for Internet and Society, where I'm a fellow, uh, uh, this guy called Rishabh Dara, he did an experiment. He sent out frivolous requests to various intermediaries to see what they would do. And some of them wrote back saying that, you know, we don't believe that this content should be taken down, but yeah, we're taking it down anyway. Now, that's, that's because there is no appeals process and there is no sort of counter pressure from users and from cont content creators to help the intermediary have, you know, incentive and justification to keep content online. So if these four elements were embedded in the process, then I think that we would begin to see what the real values underlying the process and underlying censorship and violation of privacy were, and then we would begin to have the real conversation about what's justified and what's not. Let me, let me ask you a question. You use the word censorship in that regard, but it covers, I feel, in what you say, cases that are covering a very broad range. Due process also applies to perfectly legitimate uh, takedown of content. That is not a matter of censorship. It, it ca can be the perfect uh, legal application of the rules of a country. I mean, to give the example that I often give because it concerns my country. In France, uh, things related to Nazi wear and uh, Nazi memorabilia is illegal. It's considered hate speech, uh, forbidden by law. Uh, it is not considered, I think, by uh, any actor as being censorship when it is implemented. So in the course of this discussion, and I think it's one thing that emerged clearly from the, the different meetings we had during the year, it is extremely important to use uh, a formulation that allows to distinguish the cases where there's an abuse of due process that can be called censorship. And the due process for legitimate takedowns uh, or... Um, uh, seizures and, and so on. When there's, um, um, for instance, seizures for uh, phishing sites, it is a perfectly legitimate seizure of the domain name. It still has to be a due process, which is another issue. But it's, it's very important in the debate, and I think the IGF is useful in that regard, that there is a vocabulary that is uh, not always shared by the different actors. When you use the word censorship, if I may, if I may 
Um, it is a vocabulary that is traditional among civil society actors to cover a broad range of issues and which is very uh, perceived completely differently by governments when uh, it seems to imply that what they're doing under a perfectly legitimate process is qualified in this way. So I'm trying in, in this uh, process to, to identify a common vernacular so that when you talk about takedown of seizures, these are neutral terms. And then when there is not due process, then it becomes censorship, political, or for, or for whatever. And it's very important to, to bring due process in, into account in this regard. One thing I want to follow up very briefly. You mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the scope, basically, of provisions. If I understand correctly, it's about the scope in the law, saying you don't say in the law uh, anything that is not appropriate will be taken down. It has to be more uh, precise. Is this the same as the notion of proportionality that is usu usually used in implementation of Article 29, for instance, of the Declaration of Human Rights? I'm sorry, I, I should clarify a, a little more. So the transparency standard, at least as, um, as viewed by Derek Bamba, who wrote that article, I don't know if I pronounced that right, is basically that you need to be clear one way or the other. You could include it in the rule, but um, having studied this, I think it was Colin Scott probably that, that wrote about this, where if you, if you try to make rules excessively transparent, you may also end up making them um, not wide enough to cover situations that you haven't anticipated. So it isn't necessary that it has to be absolutely transparent in the sense that it literally lists every occasion that would last, but there are different mechanisms. You could have a law that contains a broad standard, but you could have illustrations of what fits within that standard and what doesn't. And you could, especially in the initial applications of the law, have detailed reasoning for every new application. So for instance, I'm sure that there was a good reason that Google had when it decided to retain the Bangladesh video, but had it been communicated along and, and communicated widely, that would have been transparency that would have explained to everyone exactly why the standard was applied the way it was. Uh, proportionality, according to me, is a different thing. And we've actually seen quite a lot of that in the context of, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of this. Um, the Northeast is a slightly marginalized region in India. And Northeastern people are often discriminated against in the rest of the country. So we had the situation where, in actually, in my home city, uh, videos and text messages that were threatening to these people were circulated and there was just this sort of this mass exodus of these people going back and the government's reaction was to immediately censor the material that was going around and to restrict the entire country to five texts a day right and very controversially as you can imagine my stand has been that I don't I didn't feel at least it wasn't clear to me why this was a proportionate reaction yes there was a concern Yes, something needed to be done, but neither the nexus nor the need for that, that degree of uh, reaction was explained. But interestingly, nobody in my country questioned it on grounds of proportionality because it's not a word that we use often enough. So they said, okay, it's a national security concern, it's a terrible thing. So yes, the government was right in what it was doing, but my question was, was it proportionate? And so that's, that's a, it's a different thing from transparency. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll we'll move to the next uh, to the next step. But one element I want to highlight is uh, in the implementation of terms of service of uh, platforms inside. There's the same exact list of issues regarding proportionality, uh, appropriateness, transparency, and 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 due process uh, rules. Um, just also to continue to paint the picture uh, under the name of proportionality or granularity is the question of at the DNS or IP layer when the blocking for whatever reason legal non-legal is being done discriminating the right level and not blocking uh, any content at the IP address layer that or IP address level that could actually block a whole server that contains a lot of of content not only one platform but several as opposed to blocking the URI, which is the complete uh, address of that specific content, is an element of proportionality also. We don't have time to delve into, into details. I want to, um, to just plant uh, in the discussion for further um, debate, maybe, 
Um, the notion that was mentioned regarding the case in Assam and, or, or Bengal or others, we are accustomed in the Declaration of Human Rights with Article 29 exceptions for matters of public order. Uh, as I did in the session this morning, I want to, to float with immense caution and, and really big care because it's a, it's, a, it's a wording that has tremendous ramification. We are confronted with the Internet with a notion which is the question of a global public order situation where something that happens in one country has potentially very damaging effects in another uh, country and it is not in the power of either to really take due process to make decisions regarding those issues. I just put the question on the table. We don't have time to dig deeper, but I would be extremely happy if some feedback in the weeks or months to come, if you're interested in, in digging on that topic, to, to explore it. Uh, it's just actually a segue, and I'm sure that Lee may have also uh, ideas regarding this, this issue. This is a segue also to uh, the discussion on how to move forward on those uh, issues of jurisdiction for platforms. Um, intergovernmental agreements, guidelines at the uh, business level, civil society interaction with some platforms to find uh, mutual procedures. The Council of Europe has developed this recommendation on the universality of the Internet that contains a relatively new principle in its formulation, which is the responsibility of governments regarding the commitment of no transboundary harm created on the usage or access to the Internet based on their national decisions. How do you see this process moving forward, and particularly in terms of the role of IGOs? Do you think that the Council of Europe should try to continue and find implementation modes or go more laterally at the moment to try to see whether there is traction for this concept in other spaces? <coughs> and you. any other comment you want to make? <laughs> Thank you, Bethel. <laughs> Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe. Um, do not transboundary harm, yes. Uh, we're actually looking now uh, this year, next year, at cross-border internet traffic and how you know traffic crosses boundaries, this question of jurisdiction and how do no harm actually affects other, other countries and what does that mean from a human rights perspective. So we will continue that work, that's for sure. But I, I'd just like to go back to the point of um, uh, the question of proportionality. <coughs> proportionality, I think, is the crux for me in terms of my work. Um, you know, um, I mean, when, when you look at the, the reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights, it's all about the context. Proportionality for me is about the context and the weighing up and the, the balancing of those competing interests. Um, so I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, opposite that, co opposite that court, thinking about people and their rights, thinking about upstream p policy between member states, you know, their foreign policy actually, foreign policy, jurisdiction, cross border ju jurisdiction, about to avoid downstream, uh, uh, avoiding di violations of convention rights. Um, I think that the law and jurisdiction in general is confusing. When I look at your retrospects, they're very good, and it just shows me how confusing it is to, to see what's illegal in one country is not illegal in another. J just for information, the retrospect is the monthly newsletter of the uh, Internet and Jurisdiction Project that you can very happily uh, subscribe to <laughs> on the website. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and I mean, uh, a good example is the question of Google Suggest in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, and how those judgments are just, you know, at, op opposing each other. And it, it's, it's just very revealing where people, where, where we are, where, where governments are, where judges are, where courts are, regarding what what is the way forward? So I think it takes time. It's not overnight. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And, uh, you know, we talk about in, the, in previous times about media freedom uh, being a corollary to freedom of expression. So media are protected, if you like. They have a certain protection because they have responsibilities. Uh, and now if we look at media freedom online or Internet intermediaries, which we should protect, for example, Internet freedom we should protect. Will, you know, Internet freedom be a corollary of media freedom? And will that be protected by freedom of expression? I mean, these are the things which, which I'm concerned about. So, um, you know, governments, at least in the European, pan-European uh, sphere, uh, are bound to protect rights, and uh, convention rights, the right to freedom of expression, the right to private life, the right to assembly and association. They have positive and negative obligations to do things. And human rights can trans uh, human rights law, international law, can transcend uh, uh, agreements between private parties, if there's a human rights in impact in there. So... I think, that, I think the court has not yet really looked at these cases yet, but they're going to come. 
Uh, there's a case before the court now which is going to render its judgment very soon on Turkey and access to YouTube, a blanket blocking of YouTube. So we'll see what, what, what they do. So, um, but in general, what I've learned from, from, from this process of content and issues like that is that um, narrowly circumscribing the limitations uh, to any limitations to freedom of expression is really, is really the, the crux of it um, for freedom of expression. Um, and in terms of domain names you mentioned, why do human rights matter in the context of domain names? It, well, human domain names and strings uh, constitute a form of freedom of expression for, for the member states of the Council of Europe. It's not, it's not, a diff it's not different. Um, so in terms of looking at content and those sorts of things, do you know, governments have a margin of appreciation in what they do in this context? Is it, I mean, it comes down to the question of, is there a uniform concept, conception of the issue of taking down content? I don't think there's a uniform conception of, of content across globally even, not even, not even in the European space. So I think it's very difficult. Uh, and when in doubt, what do you do? When in doubt, what do you do? Do you do nothing? Do you, do you err on the side of freedom, of restraint, of caution? Well, that's where the Council of Europe is going. Uh, at least in its soft policy, upstream policy, which maybe maybe could influence downstream uh, decisions of the court. Um, you know, technology is far, very fast. Law is very slow. You, we, we all know that. Uh, I'm not sure we understand the nuances of freedom online. Uh, I think it's changing things, and I think it's. T I'm not sure it's easy for governments and for judges to, you know, when they're faced with something like this and they have a law in place which doesn't really reflect the trend on the internet, they have to apply the law. And they're not necessarily here sitting in this, in this room thinking about the nuances and the granularity of freedom and what that means globally for that matter because they have a jurisdiction to think about. And uh, I, so I think it's going to take some time uh, and I think we need to do a lot more regarding um, content takedown and regarding you know, helping decision makers and, and judges and others to, to, um, to understand more, perhaps create some bridges. And I think the last thing I'd like to say is that um, you know, we've gone from... It, We've gone from 19th century bilateralism to 20th century uh, you know, multilateralism to 21st century multi-stakeholderism. And it's a hugely new concept. And uh, uh, these sort of discussions are very helpful. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thorny subject, and I think it's, a, it's very worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one, one quick round of, of, of comments, if people want to... Uh, would. Aha. <laughs> That's the moment. Yeah, yeah. Please give your name. Uh, my name is Wout Natris. I'm a consultant from the, the Netherlands. And I think I'd like to come back to proportionality first, because I've got a bit of the impression that most cases that are mentioned now may be more incidents than a, a correct overview that governments might have. There is no digital... 911 or 112 uh, contact point in any country. If there is, please raise your hand. But how do you know which cases really should have priority next to the single Nazi paraphernalia on, on Yahoo, which needs to be closed? So how do you know what is most damaging to your own citizens if they can't report in a, in, 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 in a proper way? The second one, let's go to, to, to governments, and I'm going to give a very strange example now, but Bertrand, from our discussion yesterday, uh, you heard that let's look at where we might end and look back. In the Star Trek series of the late 60s and early 70s, which was my Star Trek period, sorry for that, <laughs> there is a global government. Oh. <laughs> and Oops, in other words, that may be where the internet is taking us. We don't know, but it may be where the internet is taking us in a while because it's opening up so many questions that maybe there is something needed. But I don't know if that's the answer, but it may be. In, in other words, governments have to redefine their remit with the internet because the traditional doesn't seem to be working as good as they want to. So that's something I think governments need to reflect on when they approach the internet in the future. And I think what the Mr. From, from the Council of Europe said, that is some of the ways forward. That's my little bit for this discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just a quick Ryan, point. While, while the mic goes around yeah. to, to the lady. And, and just a quick point. I think Ryan. there was, in fact, a federation 
but there were also Klingons and other groups <laughs> and other quasi-governments. I prefer more governments than one, personally, but just to note. Who are the Klingons? <laughs> That's the title of the next workshop in Bali, I think. <laughs> Who are the Klingons? I want the poster. <laughs> Yes, please. Hi, my name's Madeline Carr. I'm from uh, the University, Everest with University in the UK. Um, for, I would just want to thank you for a really fascinating session. I found this panel really, really interesting. Um, I, I have just a quick comment and then a question, just on, in terms of the kind of Star Trek analogy. One <laughs> of the things that strikes me from this debate is that, um, and I don't know Star Trek, so I, I can't further that analogy, but um, in, in terms of the comment that... Um, you made, sorry. Okay. Lee? Um, I'm just curious about the efficacy of, of bilateral or even multilateral um, agreements in this context. And, and um, maybe the guy from Google can, can enlighten me on that. But it seems to me that even with things like climate change, other big transnational issues that um, states are trying to deal with now, um, there can be some movement, even if you don't have 100% buy-in, but I'm just wondering about the efficacy in this context. My question, though, is going back to that very interesting um, Roja Directa case. I'm just wondering, maybe this is a question for you, Brian, but um, do you think that that case was an example of a kind of um, broader movement to kind of jurisdictional online shopping, you know, kind of um, looking for a jurisdiction that may be sympathetic to a to a case, and if, if a case is not successful in one jurisdiction, then maybe thinking more carefully about where it could go, um, either on the basis of, of the point you made about ex parte. I know there was a case in Australia a few years ago that, um, you know, people speculated that the um, defendant wouldn't be able to, to travel, and, and, and that's why the case was heard in Australia, or, or otherwise just because it's a more sympathetic jurisdiction. Thank you. Sure. Um, go ahead. Yes. So to answer the question, I'm not certain if that was a case of forum shopping, but it might have been, and forum shopping isn't new. That's been around for a long, long time. So it's one of those things that's in place that we have to take into account in the dynamic environment we're moving forward into. Um, so, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. What was your first question again? So I, I did have a thought. I did have a thought on that, and this goes back to the Michael Nebel's example about uh, the EU uh, privacy directive and the safe harbor that was developed, at least with the U.S. There were other countries who gained equivalent recognition in terms of their treatment of uh, EU-based uh, PII or data. But what businesses like is certainty, and so whether it's bilats or multilats. You know, I'm not asking for more laws. I'm not asking for treaties, but we do like certainty in terms of our operations. Those types of agreements and accommodations can provide some certainty. And users on the other side want to know that they're having their rights protected as well. So I think there is some value there. I'll leave it at that. Um, what I've always felt within, uh, within uh, the discussion about uh, cross-border online platforms and, and, and cross-border intermediaries. Um, there's one thing clear that we do when we're approaching these issues at a global level, we forget the local context of public policy. Global policy can only meet or can only converge at a point where the world is able to understand uh, how the local environment of public policy is working. And this continuous disconnect which exists at the global level between d between democratic values and religious values where religions govern states, this disconnect is the most challenging disconnect. And this is what the major contention will always be there for countries. Another important thing to realize is um, even if we do reach some kind of an understanding of the local public policy environments, there will be no single country uh, public policy design that would be conducive to the other one, because every nation is a victim of its own state. Thank you. That that's a light statement. I mean. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> Pranesh, and then. Thanks. Uh, I'm Pranesh Prakash. I'm policy director with the Center for Internet and Society in India. 
um, for, for me, the question of uh, who are the Klingons uh, in, in this is actually a very interesting uh, question uh, because the governments, it's, it's clear who they are, okay, but it's the others uh, that, that is uh, in part a bit less clear. And nation states are, by their nature, want to expand their their sovereign powers, uh, and uh, if we see what governments were 300 years ago, and if we see what all are seen as functions of governments today, it's very different, and it's only increased. It hasn't really decreased. Uh, so, in order to ha to move forward, to me it would seem that governments have to, you know, come forth and agree to give up some of what they see uh, as their sovereign rights uh, for the greater good of an open, free, and seamlessly global internet uh, that simultaneously allows for, for both the safeguarding of civil and political liberties as well as innovation, trust, and safety. So, and this for me is, the, is, is, is a conundrum because I can't really see governments coming forth and saying, okay, fine, we, this is our sovereign rights, but for the greater good of all of mankind, we are actually giving it up. Even in the debate around climate change, we haven't seen sovereign governments giving up something for the greater good of mankind. So, how are we really? How are we going to achieve this? Is for me a question. Just to say, I will close the queue after Luca Belli. <laughs> This is Gaurab uh, from Limelight Networks. I think Faud and Pranes both put a really good background to what I was coming to, is nation states will not agree to give up their right to regulate and you know police their citizens and things within their country. But at the same time, internet is cross-border and you know increasingly it's very difficult to determine where the source and where the user is and where the carrier is. Uh, I come from a part of the internet which does carriers rather than content. And for us it is really difficult to determine, you know, what regulations apply in which cases and where carriage is permitted and where carriage is not permitted. And sometimes it is very tricky, but at the same time when it comes to dealing with all of this, and as everybody ha before me has laid out the, you know, background that it's going to be rapidly changing every day, every minute, every second. You know, 72 hours of video, next minute, is, you know, one of them could be something that can blow up, you know, the entire internet for a few days. And that's, that's something you can't really determine. So, one of the things that I would like to, you know, put as a comment is, rather than looking at treaties and multi, you know, large, you know, long-term things and laws and regulation, I think if you can look at a way of signaling urgency in some of these things, you know, that, that would probably go a long way into making sure that, you know, things don't really get out of hand on a very, very quick way. And, you know, that, that'll be my uh, comment to the panel. Thanks. Michael, you wanted to say something. Of course. I, I, I just wanted to come a little bit down to our European Earth. Um, <laughs> The, um, we, we have, and that's about also the different cultures, we, we have indeed uh, developed this, this argument of having a minimum standard of commonality. And then above that, there is the, the differences are, uh, remain in existing. As a matter of fact, one of our major, the main tool of our, our legislation is not harmonization, but having something that's called a directive. It's not a regulation, it's a directive. And within, the net, net, ne, uh, within that framework, uh, the national individuality can flourish. I'm just using that as, as an answer to, to the lease um, and, and your argument for the speed. That's a very valid argument, and I have two answers to that. I mean, that's not all the answers. Um, uh, the speed issue is I've seen, and that is then again European, the European experience with the 
continental way to do legislation and the Anglo-American way to do legislation. We, we do have this sometimes very high-level principles under which you can, as I said, I, when, when I designed the data protection direction, we didn't know anything about internet problems, but it, it's formulated in such a way that you can have it for a long time so you can be rather flexible in that. Then the second thing on speed, um, we, we sometimes use then a kind of a framework where to do this, the speed adaptation, you have a, a lean, could be a multi stager and all of a sudden it's a kind of a group of people that adapt the technical requirements to the, to, to the day, which then doesn't need to go through the legislative process. I'm sorry if I'm boring with, with these kind of down-to-earth tools. And then the, the thing that we haven't talked about is uh, the agreement between the actors. Uh, just forget about the states. They might put up some principles, but within these principles, the, the, the actors might do something. And then, of course, you can take um, their force into... I, I don't like the thing when, when there's this, the big guy and the very small guys, and then you have 45 uh, pages of conditions, and you tick it because you want to get that thing, because that's not really a level playing field. But I'm talking about having con conditions which the big actors can deal with, if you have service level agreements, uh, for cloud, for instance. Or, and and the, the kind of where you have the, the small consumer is protected in something which is, which is kind of a standard contract which, which meets some of the requirements that we, we meet. So let's introduce a little bit of flexibility and forget uh, to dominate, have the state dominance all the time in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I will uh, give the mic to Luca Belli uh, and would just briefly. And... Uh, I want to introduce a few elements that came out of the uh, of the discussions in um, in Stanford and, and afterwards, and in closing, ask all the the panelists to make a very brief um, comment. Ideally, and I say it in advance so that you can begin to think about that. Ideally, if you had things in form of bullet points or words that struck you as either presenting the topic in a new manner or that could be used in the taking stock later on as messages that would that would help uh, we cannot ever exhaust the uh, the topic but um, anything that can be pointing towards where to go forward would be would be welcome Luca. good morning uh, Luca belli i am an isoc ambassador <laughs> but i'm speaking in my own capacities so i would like to uh, uh, tackle uh, an issue the issue of the ca cloud computing that uh, i think hasn't been uh, tackled in depth. So I would like to, 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 to make you uh, notice that uh, the, the cloud, cloud services provided uh, globally are building uh, a layer of, of private jurisdiction, a global layer of, of private jurisdiction. So uh, the thing is that cloud operators have actually the power to, to consecrate their, their will both in the architecture of the cloud and the terms of use of the cloud. So actually, they are acting as sovereigns of the cloud, and uh, uh, there is a contraposition between law of the cloud and law of the land. So actually, the fact that we lack a, a common framework uh, built together by uh, uh, public and private actors is actually just empowering private actors that are uh, acting as lord of this private global land, and uh, uh, I think that the multi-stakeholder model should use to and, and put in practice in order to define some guiding principles that that, that will uh, guide and determine how this uh, this uh, private jurisdiction should be should be fashioned in the future. So I would like you to think about it. Thank you. My immediate reaction is, it's very simple. You come tomorrow afternoon in the uh, other workshop we organized that has been moved from the morning to 2.30 in room four. Then the title is The Geography of Cyberspace, and it's exactly what we're going to talk about. Um, would you wanted to make a, just a very brief comment? Very brief. No, no. It's on now, thanks. Again, Valtanatis, uh, I'm going to make your compliments first for the quality of this workshop. And I've seen very good workshop now. I've learned one lesson coming back to... Yeah, yeah, it's okay. 
coming back to the gentleman from India, um, on economics. That's one of the lessons I learned here at the IGF is that where the, the, the reduction of CO2, etc., impedes on the growth of a government or a country, the growth of the internet will grow the economics of a country, and that may be a driver for all sorts of different states to, to, to use as an argument that growth is there. And the other comment I want to make from another panel is that every, there was a regulator saying there that every day governments waste on not acting towards the, the, the globality of the subject. Every year our problems are going to raise as a regulator so exponentially that two or three years from now if you wait we probably will never be able to handle it because it's grown out of proportion. We have to act now, he said. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, go, oh, sorry, was there a remote uh, participation comment? I'm s awfully sorry. I should have asked before. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Um, Mr. Uh, Doug Bolohor Eric from IGF Ivory Coast is interesting uh, for the following. How can Internet make it effective judicial system in African countries? Thank you. Uh, we have one minute and a half to solve this question. <laughs> it's jokes aside, uh, thank you for this question because we've, talking, uh, we've talked a lot about Asia, United States, a little bit. I mean, we could have talked about Brazil. Uh, but we tend to forget a certain number of, of countries, and particularly in Africa, where a certain number of countries are trying to ramp up their uh, legal framework to cover those issues. It is actually a very interesting test case of the kind of jurisdictional embrace that I was uh, talking about. In particular because in Africa there are very few operators of the technical layer and so the submission to uh, extraterritorial extension of uh, sovereignty from other regions is, is a core uh, concern. And second, the coherence between the national legislation on the whole continent is an important uh, element. But that's a whole, whole topic. Before we go for the final round of very uh, short comments, I want to highlight two quick points. The first one is related to, uh, and before Pranesh goes, to um, giving up sovereignty. There's a huge misunderstanding uh, in this debate. This is not about giving up sovereignty. Sovereignty is fundamental for having a functioning international system in that regard. But the no harm, no transboundary harm principle is coupling the notion of sovereignty with the notion of responsibility. Because if you don't have two processes, two, two notions together, you're actually going in a situation where sovereignty harms sovereignty. Because if the arms race goes on, actually the countries will be submitting themselves to the law of the strongest player or the one who has the most operators on its soil. And so this principle is a protection of sovereignty. And it's not about making a gift. It's about self-interest for the countries and for the governments. Because there is a second dimension which goes beyond the economic dimension, which is uh, the, the, the notion of getting back the capacity to enforce. In many cases, there is a challenge for countries and governments, but not only governments, agencies, courts, to actually implement the national law because the operator is in another country, because it is, not, it is out of reach. Getting appropriate frameworks, without getting into detail, is a tool for governments as well to be able to do things in this environment because we're not in a situation anymore where we can work with separating territories. We're actually trying to find tools to manage commons. The second point I wanted to highlight comes directly out of the workshop in Stanford. To make a long story short, we've talked about due process Companies develop procedures to implement their terms of service. Countries and public agents develop procedures to make requests. Not to get into details on both sides, and apologies for both governments and for uh, platforms, they're usually not completely transparent, not perfectly documented, not necessarily enough appeal processes. 
and more than anything, they are not interoperable. The, con the company don't necessarily know exactly where the request comes from, what is the legal basis, and vice versa. The requester doesn't have the one-on-one -on -one, uh, number. How do I send a request for this? How, as a user, do I flag a problem? And so what came out of the workshop, and we will go on work on this, as well as a non-transboundary harm principle, is procedural interfaces to facilitate the transactions between the different actors on seizures, takedowns, law enforcement requests, and so on. That was my, um, my, my comment. And um, now let, let's go around. Mike, do you want to, to start with the few uh, points? Really, they could relate. I'm having a, an answer to the, the gentleman with the Lord of the Clouds, but as you said, I probably have to give it tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick. Well, thank you. I'd, um, I want to uh, give Wout credit for having uh, brought in the, uh, the Star Trek reference. No <laughs> panel or no event is complete without uh, you know, some form of, of science fiction. And I'm just going to take that you know, one level further and say that, uh, you know, of course, the Starfleet uh, primary, Prime Directive, the Starfleet General Order Number 1, sometimes called the Prime Directive, is that... Uh, you know, is that uh, the, you know, the, whenever the the, 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 the you know the Captain Kirk would travel around, they they can't in, uh, interfere with the internal development of alien civilizations. And of course, that's the first thing that happens in every episode of Star Trek is that you know there's interference and there's controversy and there's all kinds of craziness. And thank God we have uh, you know four like the IGF in order to uh, in order to continue to uh, resolve those issues and figure out what our prime directive is going to be. Never seen ta Star Trek being described as a jurisdictional series, but anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. I have uh, two things to say. One is that um, on the subject of state sovereignty, I would, especially in the context of the internet, ask that we see it in terms of centers of power. So I would say that Google, for instance, is more powerful than several countries. <laughs> and I think that that's worth accounting for while, you know, while uh, thinking cross multi-jurisdictionally. And the second thing that I would say is perhaps a little controversial. But technology is neutral, and so when we have cross-border sale of technology, I would ask that we see it in terms of whether we would sell arms to certain countries that behave a certain way. So yes, we may not be able to force human rights on everybody, but do we want to give them technology to help them create big brother states or not? Konstantinos? Well, I heard uh, everybody here mentioning governments, the civil society and platforms, words like transparency and due process, uh, and I'm really happy for that. I would just add accountability. Thanks. Okay. Two Brian. points. Um, the point about difficulty in getting a global approach because there's always local policy making. There should be some baselines. One of them should be intermediary liability or la protection from liability for intermediaries who provide DNS or Internet services. Second point is education. Who do you call when there's a problem? We need to educate about the different roles of the different service providers and actors, DNS providers, ISPs, content creators. That's still not well known enough to help address the bigger problems. Okay. Lee? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, just a couple of points. I think states will act to pr protect their citizens um, if we don't create an appropriate framework to discuss these things upstream. Um, companies sitting with governments, uh, you know, mapping these things out. And my point, uh, to respond to the lady regarding efficacy, I think the efficacy is, an, is in collaboration um, between those governments, showing, demonstrating best efforts, trying to cope with the question of speed, and because all these actors are limited in capacity. Um, I think and the last point basically is that, uh, you know, duality between the human rights offline, online duality is, will soon come to an end. I think we have to address that. Thank you. Thank you to all. My message is uh, we uh, will go on with this Internet and Jurisdiction program during the year to come. Any, not only are you invited to join and, and follow the activities, if you organize meetings, if you organize regional IGFs, thematic meetings, and where you think that jurisdictional topic may fit in the agenda, don't hesitate to contact us. And in any case, as we say in TV shows, see you tomorrow at 2.30 in room 4.